Clairvoyance and Occult Powers by Swami Panchadasi or William Walker Atkinson. Lesson 6 was Clairvoyant Psychometry. This is Lesson 7, Clairvoyant Crystal Gazing. As I have informed you in the preceding lesson, crystal gazing is the second method of getting and rapport with the astral plane. Under the general term crystal gazing, I include the entire body of phenomena connected with the use of the crystal, the magic mirror, and so forth, the underlying principle being the same in all such cases. The crystal, etc., serves to focus the psychic energy of the person, in such a way that the astral senses are induced to function more readily than ordinarily. The student is cautioned against regarding the crystal or magic mirror as possessing any particular magic power in itself. On the contrary, the crystal or magic mirror serves merely as a physical instrument for the astral vision, just as the telescope or microscope performs a similar office for the physical vision. Some persons are superstitious regarding the crystal, and accord to it some weird supernatural power, but the true occultist, understanding the laws of the phenomena arising from its use, does not fall into this error. But notwithstanding what I have just said, I would be neglecting my full duty in the matter if I failed to call your attention to the fact that the continued use of a particular crystal often has the effect of polarizing its molecules so as to render it a more efficient instrument as time passes by. The longer the crystal is used by one person, the better does it seem to serve the uses of that person. I agree with many users of the crystal in their belief that each person should keep his crystal for his own personal use and not allow it to be used indiscriminately by strangers or by persons not in sympathy with occult thought. The crystal tends to become polarized according to the requirements of the person habitually using it, and it is foolish to allow this to be interfered with. The use of crystals and other bright, shining objects has been common to psychic investigators of all times and in practically all lands. In the earlier days of the race, pieces of clear quartz or shining pebbles were generally employed. Sometimes pieces of polished metal were so used. In fact, nearly every object capable of being polished has been employed in this way at some time by some person. In our own day, the same condition exists. In Australia, the native soothsayers and magicians employ water and other shining objects, and, in some cases, even bright flame, sparks, or glowing embers. <clears throat> in New Zealand, the natives frequently employ drops of blood held in the hollow of the hand. The Fijians fill a hole with water and gaze into it. South American tribes use the polished surface of black or dark-colored stones. The American Indians use water or shining pieces of flint or quartz. <clears throat> shining pieces of metal are frequently used by the primitive races. Lang, writing on the subject, said, they stare into a crystal ball, a cup, a mirror, a blot of ink, a drop of blood, a bowl of water, a pond, water in a glass bowl, or almost any polished surface. <clears throat> Excuse me again. In the present day revival of interest in crystal gazing among the wealthier classes of Europe and America, some of the high-priced teachers have insisted upon their pupils purchasing pure crystal globes, claiming that these alone are capable of serving the purpose fully, but as such crystals are very expensive. This advice has prevented many from experimenting, but that advice is erroneous, for any globe of clear quartz or even molded glass will serve the purpose equally well, and there is no need of spending 25 to 50 or more dollars for a pure crystal globe. For that matter, you may obtain very good results from the use of a watch crystal laid over a piece of black velvet. Some today use the with the best effect, small polished pieces of silver or other bright metal. Others follow the old plan of using a large drop of ink poured into a small butter plate. Some have small cups painted black on the inside into which they pour water and obtain excellent results therefrom. Above all, <clears throat> excuse me, I caution, I caution the student to pay no attention to instructions regarding the necessity of performing incantations or ceremonies over the crystal or other object employed in crystal gazing. This is but a bit of idle superstition, and it serves no useful purpose except possibly that of giving the person confidence in the thing. 
All ceremonies of this kind have for their purpose merely the holding of the attention of the person investigating and giving him confidence in the result, the latter having a decided psychological value, of course. There are but few general directions necessary for the person wishing to experiment in crystal gazing. The principal thing is to maintain quiet and an earnest, serious state of mind. Do not make a merry game of it. If you wish to obtain results, again, always have the light behind your back instead of facing you. Gaze calmly at the crystal, but do not strain your eyes. Do not try to avoid winking your eyes. There is a difference, you see, between gazing and staring, remember. Some good authorities advise making funnels of the hands and using them as you would a pair of opera glasses. In many cases, a number of trials are required before you will be able to get good results. In others, at least some results are obtained at the first trial. It is a good plan to try to bring into vision something that you have already seen with the physical eyes, some familiar object. The first sign of actual psychic seeing in the crystal usually appears as a cloudy appearance or a milky mist, the crystal gradually losing its transparency. In this milky cloud then gradually appears a form, a face, or some scene of some kind, more or less plainly defined. If you have ever developed a photographic film or plate, you will know how the picture gradually comes into view. <clears throat> W.T. Stead, S-T-E-A-D, the eminent English investigator of psychic phenomena, has written as follows regarding the phenomena of crystal gazing. Quote, there are some persons who cannot look into an ordinary globular bottle without seeing pictures form themselves without any effort or will on their part in the crystal globe. Crystal gazing seems to be the least dangerous and most simple of all forms of experimenting. You simply look into a crystal globe the size of a five shilling piece or a water bottle which is full of clear water and which is placed so that too much light does not fall upon it and then simply look at it. You make no incantations and engage in no mumbo-jumbo business. You simply look at it for two or three minutes, taking care not to tire yourself, winking as much as you please, but fixing your thought upon whatever you wish to see. Then, if you have the faculty, the glass will cloud over with a milky mist, and in the center the image is gradually precipitated in just the same way as a photograph forms on the sensitive plate. End of quote. The same authority relates the following interesting experiment with the crystal. Quote, Miss X, upon looking into the crystal on two occasions as a test, to see if she could see me when she was several miles off, saw not me, but a different friend of mine on each occasion. She had never seen either of my friends before, but immediately identified them both on seeing them afterward at my office. On one of the evenings on which we experimented in the vain attempts to photograph a double, I dined with Madame C. and her friend at a neighboring restaurant. As she glanced at the water bottle, Madame C. saw a picture beginning to form, and, looking at it from curiosity, described with considerable detail an elderly gentleman whom she had never seen before, and whom I did not in the least recognize from her description at the moment. Three hours afterward... When the seance was over, Madame C. entered the room and recognized Mr. Elliot, of Elliot and Fry, as the gentleman whom she had seen and described in the water bottle at the restaurant. On another occasion, the picture was less agreeable. It was an old man lying dead in bed with someone weeping at his feet. But who it was, or what it related to, no one knew. End of quote. Andrew Lang, another prominent investigator of psychic phenomena, gives the following interesting experiment in crystal gazing. Quote, I had given a glass ball to a young lady, Miss Bailey, B-A-I-L-L-I-E, who had scarcely any success with it. Well, she lent it to Miss Leslie, who saw a large, square, old-fashioned red sofa covered with muslin, which she afterward found in the next country house she visited. Ms. Bailey's brother, a young athlete, laughed at these experiments. He took the ball into his study and came back looking grayish. He admitted that he had seen a vision. 
somebody he knew under a lamp. He said that he would discover during the week whether or not he had seen right. This was at 5.30 on a Sunday afternoon. On Tuesday, Mr. Bailey was at a dance in a town 40 miles from his home and met a Miss Preston. On Sunday, he said to her, about half past five, you were sitting under a standard lamp in a dress I've never seen you wear before, a blue blouse with lace over the shoulders, pouring out tea for a man in blue serge whose back was toward me so that I only saw the tip of his mustache. Well, the blinds must have been up, said Miss Preston. No, I was at Dolby, said Mr. Bailey, and he undeniably was at Dolby. End of quote. <clears throat> Miss X, the well-known contributor to the English magazine Borderland, several years ago made a somewhat extended inquiry into the phenomena of crystal gazing. From her experiments, she made the following classification of the phenomena of crystal vision, which I herewith reproduce for your benefit. Her classification is as follows. 1. Images of something unconsciously observed. New reproductions, voluntary or spontaneous, and bringing no fresh knowledge to the mind. 2. Images of ideas unconsciously acquired from others. Some memory or imaginative effect which does not come from the gazer's ordinary self. Revivals of memory. Illustrations of thought. 3. Images, clairvoyant or prophetic. Pictures giving information as to something past, present, or future which the gazer has no other chance of knowing. Now, as a matter of fact, each and every form or phase of clairvoyance possible under other methods of inducing clairvoyant vision is possible in crystal gazing. It is a mistake to consider crystal gazing as a separate and distinct form of psychic phenomena. Crystal gazing is merely one particular form or method of inducing psychic or clairvoyant vision. If you will keep this in mind, you will avoid many common errors and misunderstandings in the matter. In order to give you the benefit of as many points of view as possible, I shall now quote from an old English writer on the subject of the use of the crystal. I do this realizing that sometimes a particular student will get more from one point of view than from another. Some particular phrasing will seem to reach his understanding where others fail. The directions of the English authority are as follows. Quote, what is desired through the regular use of the translucent sphere is to cultivate a personal degree of clairvoyant power, so that visions of things or events, past, present, and future, may appear clearly to the interior vision or eye of the soul. In the pursuit of this effort only, the crystal becomes at once both a beautiful, interesting, excuse me, and harmless channel of pleasure and instruction shorn of dangers, and rendered conducive to mental development. To the attainment of this desirable end, attention is asked to the following practical instructions, which, if carefully followed, will lead to success. 1. Select a quiet room where you will be entirely undisturbed, taking care that it is as far as possible free from mirrors, ornaments, pictures, glaring colors, and the like, which may otherwise distract the attention. The room should be of comfortable temperature, in accordance with the time of the year, neither cold nor hot. About 60 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit is suitable in the most cases, though allowance can be made where necessary for natural differences in the temperatures of various persons. Thus, thin, nervous, delicately organized individuals and those of lymphatic and soft, easy-going, passive types require a slightly warmer apartment than the more positive class who are known by their dark eyes, hair, and complexion combined with prominent joints. <clears throat> should a fire or any form of artificial light be necessary, it should be well screened off so as to prevent the light rays from being reflected in, or in any manner directly reaching the crystal. The room should not be dark, but rather shadowed or charged with a dull light, somewhat such as prevails on a cloudy or wet day. Number two. The crystal should be placed on its stand on a table, or it may rest on a black velvet cushion, 
but in either case it should be partially surrounded by a black silk or a similar wrap or screen, so adjusted as to cut off any undesirable reflection. Before beginning to experiment, remember that most frequently nothing will be seen on the first occasion, and possibly not for several sittings, though some sitters, if strongly gifted with psychic powers in a state of unconscious and sometimes conscious degree of unfoldment, may be fortunate enough to obtain good results at the very first trial. If, therefore, nothing is perceived during the first few attempts, do not despair or become impatient, or imagine that you will never see anything. There is a royal road to crystal vision, but it is open only to the combined password of calmness, patience, and perseverance. If at first attempt to ride a bicycle, failure ensues, well, the only way to learn is to pay attention to the necessary rules and to persevere daily until the ability to ride comes naturally, and thus it is with the would-be seer. Persevere in accordance with these simple directions, and success will sooner or later crown your efforts. Number three, commence by sitting comfortably with the eyes fixed upon the crystal, not by a fierce stare, but with a steady, calm gaze for ten minutes only on the first occasion. In taking the time, it is best to hang your watch at a distance where, while the face is clearly visible, the ticking is rendered inaudible. When the time is up, carefully put the crystal away in its case and keep it in a dark place under lock and key, allowing no one but yourself to handle it. <clears throat> at the second sitting, which should be at the same place, in the same position, and at the same time, you may increase the length of the effort to 15 minutes and continue for this period during the next five or six sittings, after which time, after which, excuse me, the time may be gradually increased, but should in no case exceed one hour. The precise order of repetition is always to be followed until the experimenter has developed an almost automatic ability to readily obtain results when it needs no longer to be adhered to. Number four. Any person or persons admitted to the room and allowed to remain while you sit should A. Keep absolute silence and B. Remain seated at a distance from you. When you have developed your latent powers, questions may then, of course, be put to you by one of those present, but even then in a very gentle or low and slow tone of voice, never suddenly or in a forceful manner. 5. When you find that the crystal begins to look dull or cloudy, with small pinpoints of light glittering therein, like tiny stars, you may know that you are commencing to obtain that for which you seek, crystalline vision. This condition may or may not continue for several settings, the crystal seeming at times to alternately appear and disappear as any mist. By and by, this hazy appearance, in its turn, will give place quite suddenly to a blindness of the senses, to all else but a blue or bluish ocean of space, against which, as if it were a background, the vision will be clearly apparent. 6. The crystal should not be used soon after taking a meal, and care should be taken in matters of diet to partake only of digestible foods and to avoid alcoholic beverages. Plain and nourishing food and outdoor exercise with contentment of mind or love of simplicity in living are great aids to success. Mental anxiety or ill health are not conducive to the desired end. Attention to correct breathing is of importance. 7. <clears throat> As regards the time at which events seen will come to pass, each seer is usually impressed with regard thereto. But, as a general rule, visions appearing in the extreme background indicate time, remo uh, excuse me, indicate time more remote, either past or future, than those perceived nearer at hand, while those appearing in the foreground or closer to the seer denote the present or immediate future. <clears throat> 8. Two principal classes of vision will present themselves to the sitter. A. The symbolic, 
indicated by the appearance of symbols such as a flag, a boat, knife, gold, etc., and b. actual scenes and personages, in action or otherwise. Persons of a positive type of organization, the more active, excitable, yet decided type, are most likely to perceive symbolically or allegorically, while those of a passive nature usually receive direct or literal revelations. Both classes will find it necessary to carefully cultivate truthfulness, unselfishness, gratitude for what is shown, and absolute confidence in the love, wisdom, and guidance of God himself. End of quote. As the student proceeds with the study of these lessons, he will become acquainted with various details and methods concerned with the various phases of clairvoyance, which knowledge he may then combine with the above, the whole aiding him in the successful manifestation of the psychic phenomena of crystal gazing, which, as I have said, is merely one phase of clairvoyance and under the same general laws and rules of manifestation. Remember that present, past, and future clairvoyance all is possible to the highly developed crystal gazer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the astral tube. Closely allied with the phenomena of crystal gazing, and that of psychometry, is that which occultists know as the astral tube although this psychic channel may be developed in ordinary clairvoyance by means of the power of concentrated attention, etc., I shall not enter into a detailed or technical discussion of the astral tube at this place, but I wish to give you a general and comprehensive view of it and its workings. In case of the strong concentration of the mind, in cases of psychometry or crystal gazing, a channel or line of force is set up in the astral substance which composes the basis of the astral plane. This is like the wake of a ship made on the surface of the water through which the ship has passed. Or it is like a current of magnetic force in the ether. It is caused by a polarization of the particles composing the astral substance which manifest in a current of intense vibrations in the astral substance, which thus serve as a ready channel for the transmission of psychic force or astral energy. The astral tube serves as a ready conductor of the vibrations, currents, and waves of energy on the astral plane, which carry to the astral senses of the person the perception of the things, objects, and scenes far removed from him in space and time. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> All over again. How these things far removed in space and time are perceived by the astral seer is explained in subsequent lessons of this course. At this place we are concerned merely with the channel through which the currents of energy flow, and which has been called the astral tube. As a writer well says, quote, Through the astral tube, the astral senses actually sense the sights, and often the sounds, being manifested at a distance, just as one may see distant sights through a telescope, or hear distant sounds through a telephone. The astral tube is used in a variety of forms of psychic phenomena. It is often used, un used unconsciously and springs into existence spontaneously under the strong influence of a vivid emotion, desire, or will. It is used by the trained psychometrist without the use of any starting point or focal center, simply by the use of his trained, developed, and concentrated will. <clears throat> Hmm. But its most familiar and common use is in connection with some object serving as a starting point or focal center. The starting point or focal center above mentioned is generally either what is known as the associated object, in the class of phenomena generally known as psychometry, or else a glass or crystal ball, or similar polished surface, in what is known as crystal gazing. End of quote. Another authority tells his readers that, quote, astral sight, when it is cramped by being directed along what is 
practically a tube is limited very much as physical sight would be under similar circumstances, though if possessed in perfection it will continue to show, even at that di distance, the R's and therefore all the emotions and most of the thoughts of the people under observation. But, it may be said, the mere fact that he is using astral sight ought to enable him to see things from all sides at once, and so it would if he were using that sight in a normal way upon an object which was fairly near him, within his astral reach, as it were. But at a distance of, a, of hundreds or thousands of miles, the case is very different. Astral sight gives us the advantage of an, an additional dimension, but there is still such a thing as position in that dimension, and it is naturally a potent factor in limiting the use of the powers on that plane. <clears throat> the limitations resemble those of a man using a telescope on the physical plane. The experimenter, for example, has a particular field of view which cannot be enlarged or altered. He is looking at his scene from a certain direction, and he cannot suddenly turn it all around and see how it looks from the other side. If he has sufficient psychic energy to spare, he may drop altogether the telescope he is using and manufacture an entirely new one for himself which will approach his objective somewhat differently, but this is not a course at all likely to be adopted in practice. End of quote. The student will find that, as we progress, many of these points, which now seem complicated and obscure, will gradually take on the aspect of simplicity and clearness. We must crawl before we can walk in psychic research, as well as in everything else. Lesson 8 will be Clairvoyant Reverie.